Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Rini. I'm the director of the graduate program in medical and biological illustration. And as Daisha said earlier, it is so nice to see everybody here. I know there are a lot of families here and preceptors. So we can't thank you enough for taking time out of your afternoon to come and spend this. That I am not prepared for. If I could tap in, <laughs> you guys realize I'm doing this for you just to break the ice. <laughs> all right, let's try that and see if that helps at all. My sincere apologies. Uh huh. Yeah, that's that should mm -hmm. solve that problem. Thank you. So welcome again. <laughs> should we go live? Should we just Already go live. Well, I mean, should we just stop? Yeah, hang on. All right, so um, we're going to try this again. I'm so sorry. Oh, I know what it is. It's I know what it is. Two microphones. No. I have my apologies. I can't see. All right, so um, that's going to solve the problem right there. I think so. Oh, when will it start solving? It's like the matrix. Um, just a minute. I'm sorry. You're getting the last five years of thesis presentations all at once. So all in. Okay. I really think this is solving the problem, and we're gonna just close it. Grace under fire. Grace Thank under you. Fire. Welcome again. Sorry about that. Um, what you're about to see is a culmination of about nine months of intense work on behalf of the students, the amazing class of 2023. The master's thesis requires students to immerse themselves in a scientific content area and illustration technique and media that in many cases are relatively new to them at the outset of the project. In developing their projects, students take on the role of co-creator, researcher, writer, producer, sculptor, animator, and many others, and now presenter. Through their exploration of the subject matter and the research uh, for an effective solution to the communication challenge, students draw upon their talents and training to create outcomes that, as you will see in a few moments, are visually captivating, artistically compelling, and done with superb craftspersonship. But we invite you to take a look deeper into these projects beyond the outward appearance and appreciate the novel contribution that each of the students has made in their own unique way to the advancement of the scientific topic or to the art of biomedical communication. These projects and the outstanding additional work of the class of 2023, which by the way, I hope you're able to view with us after the presentations at the exhibit opening are um, wonderful demonstrations of what we do as medical illustrators. That is to first thoroughly understand the subject matter, to identify the communication challenge, to know the audience, and to develop effective visual solutions to increase the viewer's understanding of important topics regarding science and human health. So I'm very excited to see the students' presentations again. 
And with that, I would like to introduce Corey Sandone. Corey is the director of the Department of Art as Applied to Medicine and the lead faculty on the thesis course. A second welcome from me, and I'm glad there's no reverb on this one. Uh, I am thrilled. This is my favorite presentation of the year. I'm delighted there are so many people who are in attendance today. Thank, I thank everyone for coming. Our first presenter is Courtney Brendahl. Courtney came to Hopkins from Oklahoma State University, Stillwater, the main campus. She earned her BS in physiology, and she worked with a faculty member in the radiology department on her thesis. Give me just a moment to pull up the presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Courtney, and today I'm excited to present my work on creating representational MRI content for radiology education. On the path to obtaining board certification, third year radiology residents become eligible to take the American Board of Radiology core exam. There are several clinical principles evaluated on the exam, and all these 16 diagnostic and interventional radiology subjects relate to medical physics. This makes medical physics a reportedly daunting subject among most radiology residents. Imaging modalities are a featured subject, and there's focus on assessing image artifacts, or the vast variety of visual anomalies that can occur during every type of imaging process. Magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, makes up the largest proportion of questions among the modalities. Overall, it's important for radiologists to learn about artifacts to avoid making inaccurate diagnoses from faulty scans. Now, although radiology is a visually dependent field, traditional methods of teaching medical physics overlook the use of visual perceptual tasks. Visual perceptual learning is improving one's ability to differentiate between various visual stimuli, which is a crucial skill for radiologists. According to the reverse hierarchy theory of perceptual learning, we're typically bombarded with numerous visual details in our everyday surroundings. The theory claims that we need the aid of a simplified cue to get the big picture. In other words, complex images alone are not enough for improving learning and simple images help to broadcast key information. For this project, I aim to create cartoon-like schematic images representative of 16 common MRI artifacts on the core exam. We received IRB approval to test with Hopkins med students and radiology residents. To evaluate the images, we needed to implement three categories of testable media for training learners to recognize common artifacts. Then we needed to use surveys and statistical analysis to analyze the effect of the media on learning and user preferences. Our goal was to see how effective our schematic designs were for learning about MRI artifacts. To produce the schematic images, I designed anatomical cross sections and artifact patterns in Adobe Photoshop and Illustrator. Cross sections are segments of anatomy captured during scanning. My cross-section designs were inspired by the Shep Logan Phantom, a standardized representation of a head cross-section. We followed the Phantom's axial division in our designs to maintain consistent anatomical orientation. Our anatomical representations were kept highly simplified so that they would not distract from the artifact patterns. And when designing the artifacts, I slightly exaggerated line weights and values so that the patterns were distinctive. To test these images, the team created and user tested an online survey using Qualtrics. We emailed a survey invitation to Hopkins medical students and radiology residents to complete at their convenience. During the 15 days the Qualtrics survey was opened, we received 98 completed responses. At the start of the survey, participants were automatically randomized into one of three categories of media they would study later. First, they would indicate their training level. The survey was bookended by a pretest and post test that had the same 18 questions. The questions were a mix of multiple choice and hotspot or selectable regions on images. 
After the pretest, participants would study from only one of three media groups. There were schematic images only, MRI images only, or a combination of both types. After studying the media, we asked participants to record their impressions of the content. Overall, we found that schematic images are as useful as studying from MRIs. This suggests our designs can play a role in pattern recognition for learning to detect artifacts in clinical scans. So let's cover the results that determine the success of our media and our survey module. First, our population of 98 participants was evenly distributed and large enough to reliably determine statistical significance. On average, participants studied the image modes for two and a half to three and a half minutes and experienced a four to five point increase across all media modes. Our statistical analysis determined that the score increase for each media mode was significant and that the score improvement was similar across all modes. In some, our participants were able to make a noticeable improvement in a short period of time with our survey media. In the engagement section, we evaluated how effective and enjoyable participants found our module to be. The majority of participants agreed with these five statements about how helpful and engaging our resource was. They scored their agreement on this five point scale and each mode received 22 out of 25 cumulative points. On a satisfaction scale of negative to positive 100, all media modes were given an average of positive 75 points. Finally, we asked participants to describe what they liked and would change about the module. The simplicity of the study content was a favorite feature. And for future improvements, participants wanted more image examples to learn from and get more clarification on physics terminology. To recap, we observed a significant score improvement across all media modes and received positive feedback about the module from our target audience. Overall, the theoretical advantage of our schematic designs is their generalizability across MRIs. Learners can refer to them for characteristic traits when looking at variations of artifacts in scans. So how will the results of the study be used? I'm currently adapting our work into learning resources that will be housed on teamrads.com, a Hopkins website that's free for anyone in the world to study radiology. The primary product was the conversion of our Qualtrics survey into an interactive module made using Unity, a game creation resource. We used participant feedback to make the new module more challenging and comprehensive. We used new, more ambiguous MRI artifact examples for greater visual perceptual difficulty and included answer feedback for students to check their knowledge. After completing the module, learners can now view their final score and review their answers from their quiz attempt. This concludes the scope of my thesis and I'd like to thank everyone who supported me. Thank you so much to my preceptor, Dr. Aaron Gomez, my advisor, Jeff Day, and the added expertise of Drs. Chris and Aaron Devers. I also want to thank my significant other, Zach, for coding parts of the project. Many heartfelt thanks to the department and my peers. And lastly, thanks to the Delta Grant for helping us reward our participants and to the Vesalius Trust for their support through the Allen Cole Scholarship. And with that, thank you for your attention. I'll now take questions. Yeah, so as I mentioned in part of the presentation, artifacts are just visual anomalies that can occur in scans. So it's an anomaly that's actually not physically present that's supposed to be present on a scan. Um, they, and for MRIs in particular, there are many different ways that artifacts can occur. So sometimes there's hardware artifacts. So it's something that's 
often wrong with the machine or the computer itself. Um, for magnetic, magnetic resonance imaging, you know, many people know you're not supposed to bring, you know, magnetized items like metal um, to, the, to, get, to the scan. So sometimes that can interfere with the machine and doing its work. Um, sometimes there's just a weird computer calculation thing and you're going to get a lot of weirdness in the scans as well. And sometimes it's the patient themselves. You're, uh, oftentimes, if you've ever had a loved one or you yourself have received an MRI scan, you're not you're told not to move during the scan and that can, the jiggling or motion from a patient can also create artifacts. There's, yeah, so it's basically an error that occurs in an image that's not actually there, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. To, so to recap, the question was about how this could potentially influence machine learning. Um, so in doing some of the literature research for this, um, there have we haven't seen schematic images used for machine learning. A lot of machine learning uses actual scans um, from actual image modalities. So that can include MRI or CT. Um, we we didn't do too much of a deep dive into how other simplistic images or other types of machine learning could be impacted within this particular topic. But we at least use the schematic images as like, a, we wanted to use it as a guiding point. And through the literature studying perceptual learning, that's one of the reasons how it led us to the simplicity. But yeah, um, machine learning, we're not entirely sure of how this could be impacted. Yeah. Oh, I think there's a, yeah. Thanks. I just I just shout it out. Sounds good. Uh, yeah. So I, you know the department is known for really detailed, highly rendered drawings, and you have to like simplify it to the max. And so, what were some of the challenges or insights you derived while trying to get to, to turn everything into basically just shapes? Yeah. Thanks for your question, Jeff. So it was mainly talking about the challenges of trying to parse everything down, trying to simplify it. Um, since this was representational content, we had to make it what I told earlier was extremely generalizable. For the cross sections, that was actually one of the more challenging things, believe it or not, the actual anatomy uh, representation. It's a, it was more like a backdrop for some of the designs we were looking for for the artifacts. But um, I think in part of our sessions with each other, Jeff and Dr. Gomez, uh, we tried to make sure that cross sections weren't looking like a face or like a weird avocado or an egg. So people wouldn't make, um, you know, these other assumptions or connections about the cross sections they were seeing. And so for some of the artifacts, they're highly specific to certain uh, regions of the body, not always, but there are some. So we had to think of other cross sections that we needed to design to specifically address those artifacts that occurred in certain regions. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there were certain artifacts where large vessels were the main part in terms of what the choosing whether or not to emit the aorta or certain other parts of anatomy that you might see in cross sections. Um, for example, this artifact here, the flow related enhancement, you typically see this more related with a large vessel flow. And that also goes for um, the flow void artifact that's also seen here. So there's there's some artifacts in particular that are highly related to how fresh blood would pass through and how fast it might pass through a region. So some artifacts uh, might not even be related to that kind of blood flow, which is why we omitted some of those patterns in, in, this, in the cross sections. Right. 
real quick, um, this presentation is real quick. There's two types of MRI, the open and the closed. This relates to the open part or the closed uh, issue. It doesn't matter. Um, thanks for your question, Mom. Uh, <laughs> so the question, so the question, <laughs> so the question was relating to open or closed MRIs. Um, from what I understand, and Dr. Gomez, uh, my preceptor, can help correct on this. I I don't think it matters because I don't think we really talked about any particular differences between the use of an open or closed MRI. Um, in MRIs, one of the main things we look for is the use of contrast. So T1 versus T2 weighted um, for specifically for head or neurological scans. Um, was something that we looked at more, um, but I don't know if Dr. Gomez can weigh in on the open versus closed. Um, we are all modeled after images obtained on a closed MR system, but mm -hmm. many of these artifacts can occur in an open system. Yeah. I think we'll have time for one final question because I think we may move on soon. Um, Yeah, great question. So the question was about how often occur, uh, certain artifacts might occur in certain parts of the body. Um, so from what I understand, most of the artifacts you see here actually do have a chance to occur in the torso The like, that was one of the standardized cross sections that we had designed. Like you can see like the, the, like an example of it here, that was the most widely used one. Um, but I don't know, like the, like the percentage of prevalence for some of these artifacts to occur. I just know that some of them are very respective. You're more commonly going to see certain artifacts in certain regions of the body. Like um, the flow void artifact that I had mentioned earlier for Lydia's question, um, you're gonna see this in like the circle of villus in the brain because there's a lot of blood flow that's going through that particular um, art, uh, arterial path. Um, and so for Gibbs truncation, that's where you have the kind of this parallel banding coming out. You're typically gonna see that in neurological regions as well, like parts of the skull Goal, um, sometimes even in parts of uh, your spinal cord as well. Um, there's just a higher likelihood that you'd see these artifacts in certain anatomy versus others, but I think they all have a chance to kind of occur in most places. Um, we, we have one question from online. Yes. And then we'll wrap. That sounds great. Yes. From Lizette Rodriguez, did you ever have to make tough decisions on what in particular to simplify in your illustration and what not to simplify, or was it pretty clear to you from the start? It's a great question, Lizette. So it was mainly talking about the challenges of what to include or exclude from our designs, um, like the inclusion of certain anatomy. Uh, I think most of the ones, when we were looking at them, there are a lot of ones that were clear cut. The motion artifacts were pretty clear cut. You could pretty much see a very straightforward pattern in some of those. But some of the other ones were very tricky, like the flow void, I think, was a tricky one. And the um, Moira fringe, that was also tricky because we wanted to make sure that going back to the thing about keeping it respective to anatomy, we needed to ensure that and that if we were including a, a, a like a venous or arterial path, that it looked somewhat accurate. And for like the Moyer fringe, it was making sure that the pattern just didn't look kind of, I don't know, goofy in a way. We had to have to workshop some things to make sure they didn't uh, to ap uh, appear too uncanny. Um, so some artifacts are more clear cut than others. Yeah. Well, I think that's all the time we have. So thank you so much for your time and your questions. All right, the next presenter will be my classmate, Libby Seidel. Let me pull up her project. Gotcha. Thank you, Courtney, and thank you for all the questions. Um, a delightful moment for me today was when Courtney got to meet her thesis preceptor, Dr. Gomez, in person for the first time. So it's a sign of the times that they worked this all remotely and excellent job. Our next presenter is Libby Seidel. Libby studied at Iowa State University in the biological and pre-medical illustration program. And for her thesis project, she worked with faculty in the Johns Hopkins Simulation Center. So I'm looking forward to her presentation.
Great. Uh, hello, I'm Libby Seidel, and I'll be presenting, illustrating, and evaluating a new visual procedural guide for central line placement. I worked on this project with Dr. Jeff Miller, Jeff Day, and Tim Phelps. The teaching and retention of procedural skills for clinical practice is a challenge in healthcare, and one of the contributing factors is the lack of guidance for procedural kits, such as this one, which is for central line placement. And studies show that the use of clinical procedural guides can help patient outcomes by reducing error, standardizing care, and promoting adherence to evidence-based practices. However, the current guidance provided in one of these kits looks something like this. They are text rich with little to no reference images or diagrams. And while this can convey clinical procedural skill guidance, it can also be problematic for multiple reasons, including confusing language, difficulties in understanding movement of steps, and information overload. There's an increased risk of complications if practitioners make mistakes. So optimally, practitioners are provided a tool which is accessible and reduces cognitive load to help them perform procedures accurately and efficiently. A little more background, a central line is a small catheter which is placed in a vein for long-term drug therapy or dialysis. Over 5 million are inserted every year in the United States alone, with around 15% of those resulting in avoidable complications on an annual basis. So the objective was to take this central line checklist and turn it into something more like this uh, by developing and evaluating an improved visual instructional guide, starting with the subclavian central line procedure. The aim was to reduce user cognitive load, improve comprehension and recall, be more understandable regardless of training level, and be better in showing the movement of procedural steps. The intended audience would be practitioners, residents, and students first learning clinical skills. This was done through two phases. The first, creating a new illustrated guide, and the second, testing the novel guide against the current mode through an IRB approved study, where the main study question was if a visual guide would help trainees better perform the procedure. So first, extensive research was done on the procedure, learning theory, clinical training, and instructional design. And while planning project design, inspiration was taken from IKEA, Legos, and airplane safety brochures due to their high data ink ratio, which has proven to be more effective for learning. I also decided on a brochure format so it could lay flat on a table without having to be touched throughout the procedure in a sterile environment, and so it could fit in the pocket of a white coat when folded up. The steps of the procedure were then developed and was used as a roadmap for the illustrations. I first created rough sketches using Procreate on the iPad. And then I made more final drawings in simple line and limited grayscale. This simple style and limited color palette was chosen so that color could be saved for very important information to catch the user's eye and provide clarity. Also making the guide accessible to multiple forms of color blindness and low vision, as well as cost effective for reprint. <clears throat> I then moved the drawings onto the computer in Adobe Illustrator and created a composition. And during this step, I made sure to follow the web content accessibility guidelines to attain a level AAA standard, as well as meeting Americans with Disabilities Act <clears throat> contrast and readability compliance. Visual presentation of text met a minimum contrast ratio of at least seven to one, which was checked using the web aim contrast checker. Then graduate students in the School of Medicine were recruited to do user testing in order to catch potential pain points and errors and ensure the guide was usable in order to run the study. Feedback was also received from clinical subject matter experts. And once the edits were made, this was the final guide. So this is the outside or the back of the pamphlet. And this is the inside. And I'll show a closer look at each page. So here's steps one through three four and five, and six through nine. And here's a mock-up of the pamphlet. So as you can see here, the pamphlet can rest on the table and the user does not need to turn any pages or touch it throughout a procedure. So phase two was the study. 
And to test the efficacy of this pamphlet, we ran an IRB approved study where we, we recruited residents in the School of Medicine to perform a central line simulation on a training model. Participants were assigned into either the control where they were given the current text instructions provided with the kit, or they were provided the intervention, which was the prototype illustrated reference guide. Participants were then asked to take a brief Qualtrics survey where they were asked about their experience and for any feedback. At the time of these results shown, 11 residents from internal medicine, emergency medicine, anesthesia, and clinical care departments were surveyed. Preliminary results showed that text-only participants, which is shown in blue, reported higher effort, frustration, and temporal demand than those who used the illustrated guide. Text-only users also reported higher cognitive load while performing the simulation. And illustrated guide users reported a higher confidence of performing the task again in the future. The final question of the survey showed the users both guides and asked them which they would prefer. And so far, 100% of the results have been in favor of the illustrated guide. Participants generally responded favorably to the illustrated guide, writing that it was clear and easy to follow. And participants given the text only guide frequently suggested that the use of visuals would have been helpful. So we were able to collect preliminary data and test the functionality of the study and created new visual procedural guide. So far, these findings support the illustrated guide and suggest that it can have a positive impact on user experience and cognitive load. These findings have practical implications for the development of procedural guides in healthcare, informing the creation of more effective materials. And going forward, we hope to expand into a mobile version for quick reference before the procedure. So here's an early mock-up of what that could look like. And we also plan to continue data collection, eventually obtaining enough data to have statistically significant results, which could be published and serve as a standard for creating more effective healthcare procedural guides. We also plan to implement the pamphlet into a new central line training course in the simulation center and be a takeaway resource distributed to residents. I'd like to thank my preceptor, Dr. Jeff Miller, and the Simulation Center staff, as well as Jeff Day and Tim Phelps for their continued support throughout this project. Also to the Vesalius Trust for funding this project and to the Department of Art as Applied to Medicine and my fellow classmates. Thank you. You're welcome questions. This way, you see, on using it. Is it deep search like a working like experience, or is it keep track of certain steps during the population? It's like, I think that you can kind of learn it. It's really a security thing. But is there a degree to which? Yeah, uh, thank you so much. And uh, the question was if um, the the checklist form of the guide is more effective for checking off as you go along the procedure or if it was used in that way to begin with. Um, so I would say while working with the residents during the study, um, most of them didn't know that the current guide existed at all. Um, it comes with the kit, but um, it's sort of hidden in another stack of papers. Um, so I would say how it's supposed to be used isn't even being utilized now. Um, this is definitely a learning tool for uh, trainees or um, residents that are learning how to perform the procedure, but it is also intended to be used for practitioners, um, either to review before the procedure or to just have on hand for quick reference. So it's not intended to be a checklist, more of a quick reference guide. Yeah, thank you.
Uh, yeah, so this was a preliminary study to test the um, cognitive load of the user. So we haven't tested whether the complications have gone down or um, safety of the procedure with this with this new guide, but that would be the future steps, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the question is if I've considered using this uh, further in terms of augmented reality or what our plans are. Um, right now, I, I think our plans are to continue with this study um, to try to get some data and publish and eventually uh, get some other procedures as well, you know, other forms of central line and then other common procedures. But um, definitely in the future, that is a great idea to use it. Um, VR and augmented reality has definitely has a place in, in teaching clinical skills, so. Just curious, that would be ideal. Um, <laughs> I think right now we're focusing on distributing it within the hospital, um, but in the future, that would be great if that was what happened. I think we have a question from... We do. Um, uh, many hospitals and clinics have only basic, low-quality, grayscale printing. I'm curious if you are able to test the clarity of this pamphlet with less than ideal printing settings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the question was if... I have tested this with less than ideal print settings because a lot of hospitals uh, will only have access to black and white uh, low quality print. And yeah, that was a big thing that went into this project was making sure that contrast and readability was prioritized and that the illustrations were simplified so that um, it could be readable from a distance as well as um, in black and white or low vision. So the accessibility was one of the number one things we thought about. Thank you. A second question also from our YouTube audience. In the future, do you plan on animating simple hand movements in the mobile version, such as simple twists or inserting of tools, or, or would they remain static? Yeah, the question was uh, for the mobile version, would we consider animating um, simple hand movements or would the images remain static? And I definitely think uh, animating would, a very simple like GIF um, short animations would be um, helpful for for that um, mobile layout, but uh, we have not moved forward with the mobile version at this time. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Oh. <laughs> we hope that people have an opportunity to follow up with questions at the reception afterwards. Our next speaker is Emily Simpson. Emily earned her undergraduate degree in scientific illustration at Arcadia University, and she worked with a faculty member in the School of Nursing on her thesis project. Hi, I'm Emily. Um, for my thesis, I work to develop a new method of creating a DIY low cost task trainer using 3D printing and levels of customizability to adapt to availability of materials. I focus specifically on creating an improved abscess incision and drainage task trainer. Uh, whoops, <laughs> sorry. No, we're good. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to pass around four trainers that I created. 
Uh, a couple of them have a 3D printed base and a silicone skin, and the others have a PVC pipe base and a gelatin skin. Uh, please feel free to palpate the surface, so touch and squish it, that's fine. <laughs> and uh, please pass them to the front at the end of my presentation. So abscess, incision, and drainage is a common procedure used for treating skin abscesses. However, if performed inadequately, infection can spread. This slide shows some typical skin abscesses. Note how the inflammatory color appears different on different skin tones. Healthcare simulation devices called task trainers allow learners to manually practice the skills and steps of a procedure and function as an important bridge between uh, book learning and practicing on a real patient. This image shows two commercial abscess incision and drainage trainers compared to the trainer that I created. These trainers cannot be reused, so that's $30 to $60 per student, and these are some of the lowest cost abscess trainers commercially available. Current healthcare simulation devices used for training skin abscess, incision, and drainage are expensive, can be difficult to procure, have limited diversity of skin tones, and often lack an accurate depiction of inflammation. To address these limitations, I developed a new method of abscess task trainer creation, including the design of a 3D printed base. The abscess task trainers created for this project are lower cost compared to the commercial alternatives and allow customizable fidelity. For this presentation, I'll use the word fidelity to refer to both realistic appearance and how well the simulated materials perform compared to their real world counterparts. Examples of fidelity that can be customized based on the assembly instructions for my trainers are a variety of skin tones, varying body mass, and the ability to add inflammation color. I then designed a prototype for an interactive resource that allows customization of the simulation device, taking into consideration material availability and uh, the cost for global accessibility. The ultimate goal of this project, sorry. The ultimate goal of this project was improved abscess incision and drainage training through cost reduction, increased fidelity, and greater diversity options, which results in better patient healthcare. I designed my abscess incision and drainage task trainer to be assembled from four components, a simulated skin, a subcutaneous layer, a filled perulent drainage pocket, and a rounded base. Different materials were tested for each component to determine how various options performed with regards to fidelity, affordability, ease of creation, reusability, creation on demand, and shelf life. In this slide, you can see an illustration with the different labeled components of the trainer and a photograph of component material options used for one of the, one of the assemblies, including a silicone skin, a water balloon, packing foam, and a 3D printed base. I tested a variety of different material options for each of the different components of the trainer. Here's an image showing how I made the silicone skins. I poured silicone onto butcher paper to give a realistic matte texture. The second image shows how I filled water balloons with conditioner to create the purulent drainage pocket of the abscess. As I performed the material tests, I evaluated and charted the results. For example, I created 68 skins for this project and assessed the success of each skin based on its fidelity, tear strength, tear and shear strength, uh, ease of creation, color, and quality. I then used the best results as a basis for writing my assembly instructions. A few different task trainer assemblies were made using the successful material options for each component. Here are some of the different assemblies. Uh, these are the higher fidelity assemblies and were most preferred by experts. Uh, task Trainer A has a 3D printed base and a silicone skin. Trainer B has a cut PVC pipe base and a gelatin skin. The downside of these assemblies is that, is that they're higher cost, though still in the $5 range, and the materials may be a bit more difficult to source. Next, these are some of the lower cost, lower fidelity assemblies. They are created using more readily available recycled materials. Trainer C uses a plastic bottle and the skin is held in place with rubber bands. 
Trainer D uses a glass bottle and the skin is uh, clipped to the cardboard frame. These trainers do not perform as well, but are lower cost and the materials are more easily sourced. Here are some pictures showing some of the different skin tone options that I was able to create and the increased realism of adding inflammation color. To help simulation center facilitators navigate the possibilities for task trainer customizability, I designed an interactive resource to allow users to select different options for the components of the abscess task trainer, the base, skin, color, drainage, and details. This allows a user to make selections based on the materials they have available. Based on these choices, uh, Based on the choices that are selected, a user receives customizable, customized instructions for abscess test trainer creation, shown on the slide, last slide. Finally, here are some photos from one of my user testing sessions with Hopkins experts in simulation and abscess incision and drainage, showing the steps of injecting anesthesia, incision, drainage, and packing. Though the design and material or through the design and material exploration for this project was performed specifically for the creation of an abscess trainer, the methods could be expanded for use creating task trainers for a variety of other procedures. Finally, here's a video showing how the trainer performs when incised. <laughs> All right, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Krista Brown, uh, my preceptor, Betsy Weisbrod, who contributed as the primary medical simulation expert for the project, and Corey Sandone, my advisor. Thank you to Juan Garcia and Andrew Etheridge for providing materials consults, the Johns Hopkins School of Nursing Sim Center volunteers for testing my prototype trainers, and the Vesalius Trust for helping to fund my thesis. Finally, thank you to friends, family, and colleagues for your support, and the art is applied to medicine, faculty, and staff. Thank you for your time, and are there any questions? So in your trials with um practicing that with the professional, what is there anything they kind of think just to say about how this performs as far as the basic realism of the surface reading? Sure. So there's uh, quite a lot of very helpful feedback from my uh, testing session with the experts. Um I think in general the consensus was that it was fairly realistic, uh, comparable to um abscesses. Several of my uh, several of the experts that uh, I was testing with had performed the procedure on patients before, as well as had um, practiced and trained the procedure with um, simulation students. So they they had um, uh, experience with with uh, how realistic these um, tissues would perform compared to the trainers. Um, I think one of the main uh, points of feedback was that um, I use a, a layer of packing foam that you could have seen on the, the trainers that were passed around to simulate sort of a, a layer of um, subcutaneous fat um, going into muscle. Um, I think the consensus was that that could be a little thicker for the majority of adult patients. Thank you. I'm just curious, um, I know like I've had some creative things in surgery to like stay the incision tight and the trouble or like you mentioned that you're not a lot of like trying to talk at all. Like how did you all think about it instead of just like us about that look like us to do something that is can get graded for if you can do it all? That's a really interesting idea. Uh, so we hadn't talked about using 
we, we really had wanted to create a pus that or a purulent drainage that most accurately mimicked uh, what you would see in, in real life, as well as had similar thickness and uh, performance. Um, however, there was some discussion amongst experts that it would be nice to have a bit of a red color uh, alongside it uh, to indicate like um, a bloody fluid along with the, the perulent drainage. Um, so it would be interesting to try and have that mix without them fully combining into, I guess, like a pinky color, because uh, there would almost be like a separate uh, fluid um, that could maybe be encapsulated in a different way. Um, but yeah, I, I'm sure that uh, so the conditioner, we could probably add dyes and things to that if you wanted to um, have a better indication. Though these, these trainers can also be like fully disassembled and reassembled easily. So you can, if you like take the parts, the layers uh, apart, you can pretty easily tell if, if everything had been drained. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Sure. So the question was about um, the challenges for deciding uh, the material for the pus as well as uh, the pressure. Um, and, and just the exploration process for that. So I, I tested quite a few different materials um, for the, uh, the pus. Um, conditioner ended up being the favorite, but I tested uh, lotion. I tested, uh, I believe, some sort of a pudding. Um, I, I wanted to steer clear a little bit from food items. I didn't want um, whatever materials I used to spoil um, because uh, shelf life was a big uh, consideration for the project. Um, so mainly I was, I was testing uh, shelf stable materials. Uh, I tested uh, toothpaste um, and, and a couple of different things. And in my tests, um, one, of, one of the tests was um, how well it, it performed once it was like filled, um, but also if it like sat around for a day or two, because generally you would assemble these ahead of time and they would need to sit for a little before you could actually perform the procedure with students. Uh, and things like toothpaste, I mean, they just kind of hardened up pretty quickly. So they no longer were useful for training the procedure with, um, with an abscess. Um, so that was one of the main considerations. Uh, one of the other benefits of conditioner is you can purchase a conditioner that already has the color inherent without having to like mix in color tone. Um, as far as uh, pressure and the considerations there, um, so the, these trainers that I passed around aren't the most effective demonstration of this, but we uh, tested with different fills into the balloon um, that was the drainage pocket. So if a balloon is overfilled, it, it um, has almost too much pressure and it really like sprays everywhere when you cut into it. Um, experts said that that could, isn't completely unrealistic, but in most cases, it wouldn't be just like so explosive or you may not want to train that with students uh, every time. <laughs> so um, a slightly less filled um, balloon was more accurate. Um, and so, so we, we tested things like that. Um, we also tested like uh, the balloons had good pressure on them, but we tested like pla filling plastic wrap and tying it off and filling uh, ends of uh, gloves and tying that off. Um, so like plastic wrap didn't have uh, as good pressure. So those were some of the tests. Thank you very much. And really appreciate Thank you. Sure. So um, the question was about use and consideration for use in other cases. So um, one of the things we had discussed um, through the project that we 
generally uh, didn't fall into the scope um, due to the time that we had, but um, we were interested in the idea of potentially creating this to be a wearable. So uh, a patient actor who is um, someone who works in a, basically a, a living person who is in a simulation scenario who uh, the students can train with as if the person was an actual patient uh, could wear a device like this. Um, so they could have, uh, the student could have the practice training, um, having a discussion, uh, consultation with this person, uh, and then actually performing the incision right on the person's arm with extra, um, some, some changes I think would be needed to ensure that there was protection there for the, for the um, wearer. Uh, the patient actor. Uh, so I think uh, the material that the device was printed in uh, could be modified so that it was much more, uh, much stronger uh, to insert in, in certain that it uh, won't be in, like it couldn't be cut through. Um, but that's definitely something we would be very interested in uh, if we continued further with the project. Thank you. Great. Thank you. That's a great question. So the question was about uh, reusability of the trainer. Um, so it depends on on the materials that are used for creating the trainer, since it's it's pretty customizable. Um, but in general, for for all my methods of creation, the base is always reusable. Whether you make it three D printed or from recycled materials or from the PVC pipe, it's kind of a solid base that you can stack things on again. Um, the balloon with the fill has to be replaced every time uh, you cut into it. It just fills everywhere. It really just needs to be replaced. But the skin is dependent on customizability. So the silicone skin, if you cut into it, uh, really either you cannot reuse it or you would need to like maybe move it further down uh, and then clip it and then make an incision a little um, displaced from where you made your first incision. So you could get some reuse out of it. Um, you could even clean off where um, you had made your, um, your marks. Uh, so like uh, you use makeup to kind of give the impression of inflammation, you can clean that off pretty easily um, and then make a new one uh, if you move the skin down. Uh, if you make the skin out of a gelatin, you can uh, melt that down again, re-pour it, and then you have a new skin. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. I'd like to introduce Jiyoung Oh, who came to us from University of Maryland College Park. She earned her degree in biology and did additional training at a local uh, fine art atelier, the Schuler School. She's going to talk about her thesis. She worked with faculty in the Institute for Cell Engineering. Mouse isn't working. Oh. Oh, geez. Hello everyone, I'm Ji Young, and for my thesis project, I was able to create an interactive learning module to educate users about the cellular mechanisms of Parkinson's disease, or PD for short. So to provide an introduction, PD is the second most common neuro neurodegenerative disorder in the world with no available cure, and nearly 90,000 people in the United States are diagnosed each year. Its symptoms are caused by the loss of dopaminergic neurons in the, bas in the basal ganglia of the brain. Dopaminergic neurons are brain cells that use dopamine to send messages throughout the brain, and movement is one of the functions of the body that are affected. PD is most commonly recognized by motor deficits such as tremor, rigidity, and postural instability. 
Unfortunately, it takes several years for it to be clinically diagnosed, and by then, it's too late to prevent progression. And as clinical symptoms are presented late into the illness, researchers are developing ways to identify these preclinical stages along with the progression of PD. An important factor of understanding PD is to understand its cellular pathways and how it affects the body as a whole. One of these cellular pathways is called parthenatos, and it's a major pathway that results in the death of these dopaminergic neurons. And the, the death of these neurons is responsible for many of the symptoms of PD. And the name parthenatos comes from the combination of emphasizing the importance of poly ADP ribose, otherwise known as PAR in the cellular pathway, and thanatos, which is a reference to the personification of death in Greek mythology. These are existing illustrations of the pathway of parthenatos that are published in papers, and they're not catered to the wide range of the audience members' education levels. Therefore, there is a need for a resource that presents the pathway of parthenatos in a manner that's not only accessible, but easier to understand for individuals with varying levels of education and expertise in this field. So for my project, I created educational modules so that audience members could understand a significant contribution to the progression of PD. I'd like to start off by introducing the mechanism and the components of parthenatos. PARP1 is an enzyme in the cell nucleus that regulates DNA damage. And when PARP1 is overactivated from extensive DNA damage, it produces these branched PAR polymers. And in the next step, PAR polymers leave the nucleus and they bind to the apoptosis inducing factor protein or AIF, which is located on the outer surface of mitochondria in the neurons. The PAR polymer and the AIF leave the outer membrane of the mitochondria together and they make their way back to the nucleus of the neurons. The PAR polymer and the AIF translocate back to the nucleus, and during this step, PAR polymer induces the binding of AIF and another protein called migration inhib inhibitory factor, or MIF, or MIF. The MIF completes this death cycle, cell death cycle of parthenatos by cleaving the DNA. The primary goal of my thesis was to provide a novel method of educating users about a major cellular mechanism of Parkinson's disease. So these steps of parthenators are broken down into scenes in an online application called Unity. Um, it's also used as a gaming application. And this allows users to absorb information at their own pace and order instead of watching a linear animation or reading through a journal article. It also lets users skip subjects that they already understand and audio narrations were also provided for accessibility purposes. My primary audience consists of PD patients and their caretakers. And the secondary audience includes undergraduate and graduate students who are interested in learning about cellular mechanisms of PD. Bless you, Carol. I use Cinema 4D and the EPMB, which is the embedded Python molecular viewer plugin within Cinema 4D to visualize molecular data that was downloaded from the protein data bank. I also use Neuron Build, which is a Python script made by Nicholas Woolridge, a professor at the University of Toronto Medical Illustration Program to import files downloaded from neuromorpha.org um, to be able to create accurate spline-based models of neuronal structures in Cinema 4D. And for 2D assets, I used Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop to create the assets of the interactive modules within Unity, and I used C-sharp scripts to build these interactive scenes. To start the interactive module basing, building process, I downloaded a neuron model from the Neuromorpho database. With the neuron build Python script within Cinema 4D, I was able to build the base form of the main neuron model that's present in each scene of my project. With the EPMV plugin in Cinema 4D, I built protein and DNA models to bring into Unity. And then in Unity, I built each scene using 15 c -sharp scripts and applied materials to the 3D assets imported from Cinema 4D. In my interactive module, the homepage shows the model of a neuron with the organelles that are relevant in this pathway, such as mitochondria, DNA, nucleus, and proteins. The intro page provides information about how PD affects different areas of the body, such as the brain, the heart, the muscles, the stomach, and the intestines. Users may also watch these animations of the steps of parthenatos at their own pace and order and read the description of what's happening in each step in the description column. 
Um, so they can learn in chronological order, skip steps they already understand, or repeat ones that they would like to learn more about. And again, there is audio narr narration provided with each step. To summarize what was created for this project, I was able to build two educational module page pages and four pages depicting the steps of Parthenados, along with providing voice narration of each page for accessibility purposes. We were able to informally survey 15 PhD students of my preceptor's lab, the Dawson lab, half of whom were either familiar and half who were unfamiliar with the um, cycle of Parthenados. They were asked what part of the modules helped them understand Parthenados the best. They also ranked the usefulness of different parts of the modules, such as the intro page and the format of the animations. They indicated that having the steps of the mechanism split into separate scenes was helpful for retaining information. And the animations of cellular, cellular mechanisms was commonly voted the most important aspect. However, another common response was that 2D animations and protein models could have been just as effective. And the intro page was voted as the least necessary in the project with the assumption that primary audience members um, or users would already have that background knowledge if they were diagnosed with PD. In conclusion, Parkinson's disease poses a significant challenge for both patients and clinicians due to its complex nature. However, through this project, the wide range of education levels among users was the primary factor kept in mind. It was also the reason for providing a base of information, such as the introduction um, and glossary scenes. And the workflow, the workflow details I provided within my thesis will hopefully serve as a foundation for future contributions. And one of these contributions could be potentially teaching about other cellular pathways. Another contribution consideration would be to teach about other neurological conditions affected by Parthenados, such as Alzheimer's and Huntington's disease. And by continuing to build on this foundation, users will be able to further their, further their understanding of Parkinson's disease itself. I would like to thank my preceptors, Drs. Ted and Belina Dawson for their expert knowledge, Noelle Burgess for her feedback, and Jennifer Fairman for her guidance. I'd also like to thank my wonderful classmates and the faculty and staff of the department. Uh, thank you. I now welcome comments and questions. Um, the question from Noel was out of the thoughts of proteins involved in this pathway, um, which ones were the ones you chose and the reasons why? Um, are you referring to the proteins within Parthenados itself or all of the mechanisms in um, involved in Parkinson's disease? Relation to the audience. Um, while I was doing my research, I chose, it seems to be that there was a lot of overlap within these specific proteins, AF, MIF, um, in the journals that I read in Parkinson, about Parkinson's and Parthenados. Um, I also thought that this pathway would be relatively um, easy to understand for audience members, especially our prim my primary audience. So yeah, that's why I chose these. <laughs> yes. Also, you helped me um, obtain these models a lot. <laughs> Yeah.
Yeah, um, David's question was about the feedback from PhD students on how 2D animations would have been just as effective as 3D um, to kind of expand on that. So since my questions weren't official IRB approved questions, um, and I also didn't have a like an actual form of comparison between a 2D module and a 3D module, um, the I believe the question that I asked was it, like simply, would you would this have been just as effective in 2D mode? And most students said yes. I think in terms of that, to get a more concrete answer, I would like to actually in the future create a 2D version of this module um, with an Adobe Illustrator and After Effects, and then maybe kind of survey and compare those. But yeah, unfortunately, I didn't have a concrete 2D version to to have them compare the two. So that answer, I think it could be taken with a kind of grain of salt. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Gia. Miranda Stano is our next presenter. Miranda studied at the Cleveland Institute of Art and received a BFA. She did her sciences at Case Western. Hi, I'm Miranda Stano, and I'll be presenting my thesis, Personalized Visualization of Congenital Heart Disease for Communication with Families. Congenital heart diseases appear in about one in 110 live births in the United States, making them one of the most common types of birth defect. Depending on the disease presentation, CHD can be a life-threatening condition and require prompt surgical intervention after birth. In total, there are about 20 to 50 different types of CHD. These garden variety CHDs account for about 50% of cases. The remaining 50% are rare patient-specific anomalies. Adding to the complexity of the issue, phenotypes can appear in combinations. For example, coarctation of the aorta often occurs with ventricular septal defect. Due to the physiologic complexity of CHDs and their advanced medical terminology, it can be very difficult for families to obtain, to obtain an adequate understanding of their infant's condition. When discussing care for CHD, available educational resources have limited effectiveness in communicating the nuances of CHD. Illustrations provide a static view of the heart that can prevent a learner from fully appreciating its complex structure. Furthermore, while many patients have a combination of CHDs, Available visuals depict only one phenotype at a time. This places additional burden on families as they learn about their child's condition through nonspecific visuals. The goal of this thesis was to design an interactive web application that can assist doctors in creating patient-specific 3D models of the heart for families. This was designed to fulfill the following three objectives. First, depict complex CHD morphologies through customizable 3D models. Second, improve the surgical consent process for treatment by creating didactic visualizations that allow learners to quickly comprehend complicated medical information. And lastly, provide families with educational material that they may access throughout the treatment process. The interface was designed with Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop. CT and MRI data sets depicting coarctation and BSD were obtained from Johns Hopkins Hospital. Data segmentation was completed using Oros and 3D Slicer. Extracted models were then cleaned and textured using ZBrush. Cinema 4D was used to create 3D animated components, while Adobe After Effects was utilized to produce an animated prototype. One IRB-approved interview was conducted to gain an understanding of the CHD patient family experience, identify educational materials accessed during treatment, 
and assess the helpfulness of these materials. In addition, the, inter the interview investigated pre preferences toward this project's design. A site map was created to determine application structure and relationships between content. Based on the user profile, that is patient, family, or physician, a corresponding interface will load upon user login. From here, patient families can access models shared by their physician, explore pre-made models of typical CHD types or share models. Physicians can access previously saved models, share models, or create new models. New models can be created from a normal heart or CHD preset. A style guide was determined to ensure consistency in fonts and colors across the application's pages and assets. A user interface guide was produced to specify tool functions and the visual coding of didactic elements. All pages pertaining to model creation and viewing underwent further planning, resulting in high fidelity wireframes. Here's the design for the physician model editing interface. The model can be rotated and zoomed. Through the plane modifications menu, planes through the heart can be selected. In the right panel, various tools can be selected to add defects or edit the anatomy. The grow shrink menu allows hypertrophy and hypoplasia to be added to tissues. The note builder allows physicians to create modules for the patient family to review. Elements from the note builder, such as text, can be directly associated with anatomy on the model. Now, how does this translate to the patient family interface? Notes created by the physician automatically populate on the model. Toggle buttons under show activate anatomy labels, blood flow, and side-by-side -side comparison with a normal heart. For their personal reference, patient families can create their own comments on the anatomy. The patient family interview outlined the difficulties of facing a sudden CHD diagnosis with limited experience with medical terminology. The participant reflected that visual educational materials were instrumental in comprehending CHD. Even when confused by unfamiliar terminology and difficult anatomy, the participant felt that an annotated drawing was the sole piece of information that they could truly comprehend, stating, I did get the drawing, but other than that, that was pretty much all I understood. This information speaks volumes concerning the effectiveness of visual media in medical education and further justifies the need for improving visualizations of CHD. Project assets received a positive response. If fully developed, this application may inform the surgical consent process for CHD. It could be embedded into clinical workflows and the application framework could also be applied to other clinical subspecialties, expanding across new patient populations. In conclusion, this project has successfully designed an application that depicts CHD phenotypes using customizable 3D models, identified a means of improving the surgical consent process and planned a resource that can be accessed throughout treatment. I'd like to thank Dr. Gottlieb Sen for providing her time and expertise, Lydia Gregg for her guidance, and the Vesalius Trust for funding this work. A special thanks to friends, family, and colleagues for their support during this project. Thank you for your attention. I now welcome comments and questions.
Great, thank you so much. Yeah, so the question was, um, does could this apply to say surgical rehearsal? Um, I, I think so. Uh, there are a lot of different um, avenues that uh, this framework could apply to. And I think surgical uh, rehearsal would be a strong candidate for that. <laughs> Very useful. Yeah, so the question was, um, what feedback have I, did I get uh, during the development process? And then what do I hope to obtain later on? Um, so uh, during the development process, I worked with um, my preceptor and her team of pediatric cardiologists um, uh, to get feedback on application design. Um, so she was heavily involved in um, uh, guiding this project. Uh, and then also the patient family interview that I conducted um, shaped a little bit of the application. Going forward, though, I would love to do more studies. Um, I think that that would add a lot of value to this. And um, uh, yeah, I think uh, it would improve this piece even more. Uh, for the patient family. Um, yeah, the feedback was to integrate a, well, generally um, the assets were positively received. Uh, I got um, a lot of uh, compliments about the interface and the simple, the simplicity of the design along with the color palette um, and it being like a soothing feeling overall. Uh, um, but uh, one component that um, I added in because of the feedback was a note function for the patient families to use um, so that if they had questions while they were reviewing a model, they could write it down right in the application. Thank you. Anne Mai is our next presenter. Anne earned her undergraduate degree, a BS in biology from California State University, Long Beach. She also uh, received a certificate in biomedical illustration prep from the same institution. She worked with a faculty member in the Department of Pathology for her thesis. Thank you, Corey, for introducing me.
Then from uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I can't read it from here. Hi. Nope. There. That's it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anne, and today I'm going to present to you my thesis, Visualizing MIPSA, Exploring Web-Based User Experience Design in Teaching and Promoting Molecular Technology. I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Larman from the Department of Pathology and my faculty advisor, David Reaney. So a little bit of background about my project. Antibodies are crucial components of the immune system they're responsible for recognizing and neutralizing foreign substances known as antigens. They can provide valuable insights into our health, including autoimmunity, cancer progression, and infectious diseases. So as a result, antibody profiling is emerging as an essential tool to provide clinicians and researchers with earlier diagnosis and opportunities for effective treatments. So what is antibody profiling? It is a lab technique used to determine the presence and levels of antibodies in a patient. It typically involves taking a blood sample from the individual and testing it against a target antigen or a library of antigens. There are several methods for performing antibody profiling, including microarray and molecular display-based methods. However, these current methods are limited by their library contents, sample throughput, meaning the amount of material or items passing through a system, and lastly, high cost. So a novel molecular display technology was recently developed by researchers in the Department of Pathology at Johns Hopkins. It is called Molecular Indexing of Proteins by Self-Assembly, or MIPSA. MIPSA employs self-assembly method to create a large antigen library with the highest sample throughput, all at a significantly lower cost. And these antigens are all identifiable by short strands of DNA barcodes. The problem I'm trying to tackle with my project is that there are currently no existing visuals that explain the complex science of MIPSA and its potential applications. So in order to encourage um, adaptation of this new technology, it is important that the target audience understands how it works. My objective is to create an informative website featuring a multimedia approach that will entice the audience to learn about MIPSA and the power of antibody profiling. The web-based format gives access to a large audience and allow users to navigate content at their own pace. Furthermore, a combination of animations and visuals will be used to assist and enhance the learning process. And the primary audience for my project are scientific researchers and potential investors familiar with molecular technologies. There are two stages of the project. The first stage is the concept development and second, the website creation. For the concept development, I conducted literature research that were related to antibody profiling, such as current applications and current methods. And I was also provided with a case study research article where MIPSA was utilized to identify new autoantibodies that were found in patients with severe COVID. Next, I created a flowchart for the website to plan the flow of content and the website's function. I then created a wireframe using Adobe Illustrator to plan out the visual placements for the website. And here's a concept sketch for the homepage of the website. To develop the content for the website, I used an app called Millinote to write and organize the website content. And here's how it looked like. So for the next phase, um, which is the website creation, I started with creating the assets for my homepage. Um, so the 3D assets were created in a program called Cinema 4D and the scenes were created. For the didactic portion of the website, I used 2D images to um, facilitate the learning because 2D images, they do a very great job 
at leaving out extraneous details and in, um, helping user focus more on the learning. I use a sketch and tune effect in Cinema 4D to study the form. Uh, in this example here is the ribosome. And from that, I went to Adobe Illustrator to recreate the asset. Since the 2D assets were already created, I used them to develop the storyboards for the two animations I'm going to include on the website. I brought them, then I brought them into After Effects to animate the scene. The Namecheap website was used to purchase a custom domain name and then later connect to the hosting service. The Elementor Cloud service was used as the hosting service and the, the, and the Elementor Pro was used as the website builder to create the website. And lastly, WordPress was used as the website management system. And here's a summary of all the softwares and applications that were used to create the website. So the result is a promotional website that is accessible on various types of devices. It is a standalone website and is currently live the website features illustrations, animations, and interactivity to, to educate the audience with an engaging user experience. Next, I'm going to play a demo of the website. So the homepage briefly introduced a topic in four main sections as shown here. So here is the introduction to the technology. In the second part, the background information uh, about the immune system. And here it introduces uh, the science behind MIPSA, and lastly, uh, the potential applications of MIPSA in research and links to relevant publications. So let's check out the first page. Here, the audience is going to be introduced briefly to the immune system, the roles of antibodies, and the benefits of antibody profiling. And at the end of each page, I included a button here that prompts the user to navigate to the next page to learn more. And the next section is where the bulk of the content lies. Um, it explains step-by-step -step the signs behind MIPSA as the user scroll through. And as you can see, the content is accompanied by visuals to help with the learning process and animations to explain the more complex concepts. So right here, it shows the reverse transcription. And I also included labels in the animation. I'm going to skip ahead here due to time constraint. Okay, and right here, I also included a sample data that was obtained using MIPSA. So this graph shows the regions of the COVID virus spike protein where the antibodies bind to. And the hotter the color, the more reactivities by antibodies. Okay. And this page includes external links to re relevant publications showing different applications of antibody profiling in research. And lastly, the About Us page provides background about the inventors as well as their vision and mission for this exciting technology. And there's also a contact form at the end where interested party can reach out to inquire more about MIPSA. Cool. So an informal survey was conducted among researchers and lab members at the Johns Hopkins Department of Pathology and colleagues at the Department of Art as Supplied to Medicine to assess the website's effectiveness. In summary, the feedback gather indicates that the MIPSA website was effective in achieving its intended goal of providing concise and understandable information, intuitive navigation, and impactful visuals. However, some improvements could be made to enhance the website's usability and accessibility. As for website performance, it received high ratings for image resolution and screen size responsiveness. However, the load time was rated as average, which may be attributed to the large size of media files and the user's Wi-Fi speed. 
For the future directions, since the project did not include a formal evaluations of the website's effectiveness in promoting learning or knowledge retention, future studies may explore these issues in greater details and quantify the extent to which the website achieved its intended goals. In conclusion, the development of the website visualizes MIPSA for the very first time. It provides an engaging and valuable educational tool for researchers, investor, and other stakeholders in the biotechnology industry. And overall, the website highlights the importance of didactic multi multimedia use in the promotion of teaching of in the promotion and teaching of emerging technologies in the life sciences. I'd like to take the time to thank my preceptor, Dr. Larman, and my advisor, David Rini, for the guidance and support throughout my thesis project. I'd like to thank the Versailles Trust for funding this project, my friends, family, the faculty from my department, and my awesome classmates. I will now take any questions or comments. Thank you. Oh, and you can visit the website, by the way, if you scan the code. Yeah, this is awesome. Um, I didn't see this in my eyes. Um, I think these are really interesting guys to be How do you decide where to use? The, the 3D assets versus the 2D. Yeah, thanks for your question. Um, so the question was, how did I decide where to use the 3D assets versus the 2D assets? So um, for the homepage, I decided to go with the 3D because I feel like 3D could create a very realistic environment. And I feel like it does a very good job of capturing the audience attention. So that's why I put it on the homepage, just to snatch them up. <laughs> and um, for the didactic portion, I feel like 2D uh, images would be better since they are usually cleaner and there are less details that the user have to look at. And um, they are there to assist the content, not take the attention away from the content. So that was my thought process. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lauren. Question for our YouTube audience. Um, beautiful work, great design, so much web traffic is via phone now. How does the site look and play on cell site? Yeah, so when I was creating the website, I did take into account um, the different uh, screen size. So I did make sure to format them to look right, either on tablets, smaller laptop screens, bigger uh, desktop screen, and as well as mobiles. And you can definitely check it out on your phone if you like. <laughs> All right, if there's no more questions, thank you so much for listening. Our penultimate presenter is Lily Armstrong Davies, who earned her BS in ecology and evolutionary biology from Tulane University. Oh no. <laughs> Is that 
Hi, everyone. My name is Lily Armstrong Davies. I'll be presenting today on my thesis project, Visualizing Brain Size Evolution in South American Monkeys. My thesis advisor was Tim Phelps, and my preceptor was Dr. Siobhan Cook. As a brief overview, I'll describe the three main components of my study. First, I did a digital reconstruction of a skull fossil of the species Sebupithecia sarmientoi. Next, an endocast extrapolation of a reconstructed skull and the skulls of 16 genera of South American monkeys. You'll hear me say the word endocast a lot. An endocast is the cast made from the largest cavity of a cranium, and it's used as a proxy for brain size. Lastly, a statistical comparison between the 17 endocasts uh, that was used to build a phylogenetic tree visualizing the relative brain sizes of South American monkeys in an evolutionary timescale. All right, so in 2018, Dr. Cook discovered a skull fossil at an archeological site in Colombia called La Venta. Uh, this is one of the richest sites ever for mammal fossils in the world. The skull was compared to existing teeth and mandible fragments and determined to be the species Sebupithecia sarmientoi. And here's an original photograph of the fossil. The skull is 13 million years old, making it the oldest and most complete South American monkey, monkey skull ever found. Uh, this is a huge find. It's in fairly decent shape. Uh, you can see some subluxation of the frontal bone where it was pushed back and down. Additionally, it's missing its orbits, mandibular angles, zygomatic bones, and several teeth. And the skull was filled with hardened sediment that had to be digitally segmented out. So I was provided this digital segmentation by Dr. Brian Shear at NYU, where he separated the bone from that surrounding sediment. The segmentation was done in a, a software called Aviso and visualized here in a software called 3D Slicer. So to begin the reconstruction, the segmented cranium was imported into the software ZBrush. And here you can see the frontal bone was pulled forward and up to correct for that segment uh, subluxation. Several of the bones were broken, and here you can see a before and after of the right parietal bone after reconstruction um, where those bones were healed. And because so much skeletal information was missing, geometry from Cebu Pathesia's closest relative, Pathesia Pathesia, was added. Um, here you can see the upper incisors and mandibular angles from Pathesia Pathesia that were appended to um, Cebu Pathesia's skull. And this process was done for all of those other missing um, skeletal parts. So here are the final results of the skull reconstruction. Sebupithecia had previously only been identified by mandible fragments, teeth, and postcranial uh, bones, so kind of things that are um, in the body. And this is the first skull. So what scientists were immediately observing after discovery is that Sebupithecia has a cranium that is substantially smaller than its closest living relatives. And to visualize this, here's Sebupithecia on the left next to its closest living relative, Pithecia pithecia. So you can see that the facial bones are about the same width, um, but the cranium is much, much smaller. And this shape difference implies a smaller brain size, uh, something that we could confirm by extrapolating and comparing the endocasts. So I extrapolated endocasts from 16 genera of South American monkeys in 3D Slicer and reconstructed Cebu Pathesia's endocast in ZBrush. And I'll demonstrate how the endocast workflow um, worked on a pygmy marmoset this is one of the monkeys that was included in the study and the smallest of the South American monkeys. <laughs> First, a micro CT scan of the skull was downloaded from the open source website Morphosource and uploaded into 3D Slicer. I then measured uh, the jaw length to use as a proxy for body size. Next, a new plugin called Wrap Solidify. Um, with using that, I was able to fill that largest cavity in the cranium and create a new segmentation that's known as the endocast. And I calculated the volume of this endocast to use as a proxy for the brain size. For Cebu Pathesia, this was the first time that an endocast was being extrapolated from a skull reconstruction. And I encountered a lot of pain points in the workflow that I just described. Um, so as an alternative, I sculpted the reconstructed endocast in ZBrush. And here is a before and after. So here are the endocasts for all 17 of those monkeys. Uh, they're currently arranged by absolute volume with the largest monkeys at the top left 
and the smallest monkeys towards the bottom right. And these, the five families of South American monkeys are all color coded. So now that I had all the necessary data points, I could move on to statistical comparison. First, I ran a reduced major axis regression in a software called PAST4, and then designed phylogenetic trees in Adobe Illustrator to visualize the relative brain sizes within an evolutionary timescale. So here are the results of the RMA regression. Um, on the x-axis is the proxy for body size that we got from the jaw length, and on the y-axis is the proxy for brain size that we got from those endocast volumes. Uh, the diagonal line is the line of best fit, implying the expected brain size at a certain body size. So here's Sebupathesia. Um, if its brain size matched what would be expected of its body size, it would be up closer here um, to its closest relative, Pathesia Pathesia. Moving on to the phylogenetic trees, um, this first one represents the absolute volume of every brain. And once you normalize for body size, you can see that the majority of the brain sizes are about what you would expect given their body size. So they're all about the same size. And again, the exception to this pattern is Sebupathesia with a smaller relative brain size compared to its living relatives. Okay, so we confirm that Sebupathesia has a smaller brain than expected, but why is this finding meaningful? So Sebupathesia represents an ancestral form of South American monkey that existed before selection pressures led to brain size increases. Um, and there's no current consensus on exactly what those selection pressures are, but I'll discuss some of the relevant hypotheses. So scientists have found that monkeys with diets that are high in protein, fat, and sugar are more likely to have a larger brain as they can meet the metabolic requirements necessary for having a large brain. Um, from teeth fossils, we know that Sebupathesia had a diet like this, but it doesn't have a large brain, um, which might imply that just because you can support a large brain doesn't necessarily mean that you need one. So one major hypothesis um, called the social brain hypothesis points to the need of a large brain when navigating large complex social groups. Um, so basically the ability to understand the relationships and loyalties between other monkeys in your network um, may require a high degree of cognition and in turn a larger brain. So we don't know what Sebupathesia's social life looks like, but this discovery does represent an exciting new data point in the research surrounding brain size evolution. And we aim to publish these novel findings in high impact journals in the coming months. I'd like to give a big thank you to my preceptor, Dr. Cook, for all of her guidance and my thesis advisor, Tim Phelps, um, as well as all the additional experts that provided their data and tutorials. Additionally, I'd like to thank all of the faculty of Art as Applied to Medicine, as well as my classmates, my family, and my friends. Um, so with that, thank you so much for your time, and I open the floor to any questions or comments. So the question was, how do you know it wasn't a fossil of a baby? Um, I actually don't know the answer to the question. I can refer to Dr. Cook. Um, I assume there's some maturity um, in the bone structure and it maybe in the teeth. I think for, I'm assuming a smaller monkey would have smaller teeth, yeah. Um, yes, we have two different both based on um, cell Thank you so much. Yes, yeah. Um, the 16 monkeys exist now. You can go find them in the wild. Um, 
I didn't include the common names and I apologize for that. Um, <laughs> they're all the Latin names. Yeah, absolutely. So the question was, um, what were the challenges in extrapolating an endocast um, in 3D slicer like I did for the other monkeys? Um, this is going to be a very technical answer, um, but basically when we were in um, one of the programs, you get all of that interior 3D information. Um, and as soon as you come out of the program and you export, you end up with a mesh that's just, just the outside information. Um, and so it led to all of these difficulties, bringing it back into 3D Slicer with a, a ton of errors. Um, so the answer to that would be to bring it back into a Viso, create a new TIFF stack, bring it back. It, like it, it just, um, yeah, it was just the missing kind of interior information that was the problem. Uh, we can talk about it later. Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. So the answer or the question was, um, is there any work being done to kind of put together the full skeleton of this monkey? Um, like, as, as I said, all we have are kind of um, like parts of a femur bone, like the ends of the femur. So we don't know exactly how big it would have been. Um, so we have to use those relatives to kind of get a, a good guess of how large it would have been. Um, so we don't have that information currently. And I think with further kind of excavation at the archaeological sites, hopefully we'll get more and more information about the anatomy. Yeah. From the YouTube audience to Gabby Rivera, um, what limitations or constraints did you have to keep in mind throughout your reconstruction? Um, so the question was, what limitations or constraints did I have to keep in mind during the reconstruction? Um, Gabby did a similar project last year. And so um, as she knows, I think because of you have all this missing information and so you're really just kind of giving your best guess about what it may have looked like based on its um, kind of evolutionary lineage. Um, so there are parts of it that may actually look quite different than the way that I reconstructed it. And so it's kind of, yeah, just a stab in the dark in some ways. Yeah, awesome. Thank you all so much. Our final presenter is Gilbert Chen. Gilbert graduated from Zheng Yuan Christian University in Taiwan with a BS in Bioscience and Technology. And I just wanna give a really big shout out to Gilbert's fan club who is watching from Taiwan because it's um, pretty early in the morning right now over there. <laughs> so please welcome Gilbert. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Gilbert Chan. Today, I will talk about my thesis project, Endoscopic Endonasal Scope Based Surgery, or ESBS, for pituitary lesions, an AI assisted creative workflow to develop an animated educational uh, resource for patients and physicians. I have had a great time collaborating with my mentor, Dr. Nicholas Rowan, a sinus surgeon at Hopkins, my faculty advisor, Juan Garcia and uh, co-advisor Corey Sandon. Okay, in my thesis, I developed an animated patient education resource for ESBS. ESBS is a minimal invasive surgery that reaches a pituitary lesion through the nasal cavity instead of approaching the lesion through the top of the skull. It's less invasive, it's safer, it's more precise than traditional craniotomy approach and has now become the primary method for removing the pituitary lesions. Teaching patients about ESBS can be tricky. 
due to the complex anatomy involved, the subtle uh, differences between surgeries and the scattered information on the internet. These factors make it really challenging for physician to explain and for patient to understand. So we set out our goals to fill up those gaps. The first goal of the project is to create an animated resource to help patients understand the treatment process better. The second one is to use AI tools to make animation production faster and cheaper. This is a typical animation workflow that I was using. The process involved researching the surgery, including observing the surgery in the OR, in the consultation in the clinic, and then writing the script, creating voiceovers, developing a style, storyboarding, and finally animating it. To incorporate the AI tools into the current animation workflow, I used ChatGPT to help with the script writing, Mid Journey to provide style inspiration, and Eleven Lab to create the voiceover. So for script writing, I use ChatGPT to draft an initial script based on specific instruction for tone, length, and the level of writing in the first portion of my prompt. I provided a, a story outline based on the research I did earlier as a writing reference for ChatGPT in the second portion of my prompt. The key here is to double check everything that ChatGPT produces because ChatGPT can occasionally produce inaccurate information. For the voiceover, I use Eleven Lab and AI driven text to speech software that creates speech in real time. It's super handy for quick adjustments and tweaks. So basically, if you are not uh, satisfied with your result, you can just simply change the setting and then regenerate it. For the animation style, I used Mid Journey and ARR Generator to quickly explore different styles and generate inspiration for layout design. Mid Journey is an R, uh, AIR generator. User can use simple text prompt to describe the, the desired image, and then Mid Journey will generate the image accordingly. And then I gather the image generated from Mid Journey into my mood board and further develop them into a style guide. Based on the style guide, I started making art assets uh, for animation using Adobe Illustrator. I was paying particular attention to simplifying the facials while maintaining the proper anatomical proportion. I then compiled the art assets and designed together, uh, produce a storyboard using Adobe Illustrator. The storyboard includes 12 mini animation sections and in total 65 frames. Finally, I will uh, play two out of the 12 animation section to demonstrate my results. The pituitary gland is a pea-sized gland located at the base of the gut. Pituitary tumors are found in the pituitary gland, which is responsible for the control of many bodily functions through the hormones that it produces. Pituitary lesions may be detected with or without symptoms. In fact, in many cases, pituitary lesions may be completely asymptomatic and found on a head MRI or CT scan that is performed for another reason. Lesions may cause headaches, vision loss, or hormonal problems such as weight gain, diabetes, or growth of the hands, feet, and face, potentially suggesting a problem with the endocrine. Ectoscopic endonasal scalding surgery, CESD. At the start of the procedure, the EMG surgeon creates a path through the nasal cord. This may include performing a septoplasty to straighten the bone and cartilage in the middle of the neck. Often it involves moving or removing a portion of nasal turbulence, the structures inside the nose responsible for nasal humidification. With this completed, the surgeon can then access the sphenoid phone. In some cases, at this time, the surgeon creates a nasal septal block. This involves an incision in the mucous membrane of the nasal septum in the middle of the neck. This membrane can be used and used for reconstruction at the end of the surgery if it is needed. When the flap is completed, the bone of the sphenoid sinus is opened in the front, and then 
in the back. With the opening of the funeral fire completed, the neurosurgeon has direct access to the pituitary region. The lining of the brain, known as the dura angle, is then cut, and the tumor is removed through the lens. During this portion of the surgery, a brain fluid leak, known as a CFS leak, may occur. Following tumor removal, it is important to reconstruct the surgical site, especially if there is a brain fluid leak. This may range from a small piece of absorbable material to a separate graft or even a nasal septal graft created from the patient's own mucosal membrane, as mentioned earlier. Detecting a Okay, let's now talk about the discussion. <laughs> Our project focused on creating an animated resource for ESBS. We we're making sure the layout and animation were consistent for EC future updates. We also create our assets can serve as resource for future uh, patient education on sim similar procedures. However, we should be aware of the risks of using AI in uh, creative workflow. AI can produce misleading or inaccurate information and has potential bias due to its being trained based on pre-existing content, which might carry inherent biases. Also, there are legal and ethical issues uh, about the authorship and the originality to be considered. Despite these challenges, uh, AI still offers significant benefits. For example, we can use AI chatbots to quickly uh, gathering references, generating visual ideas, or even coding for interactive design. Be, uh, but remember that uh, while these tools are great, we shouldn't compromise the story that we are telling. I think uh, it's important to note that it's a story that matters the most, not the tool that we use to tell it. Finally, I would like to give a shout out to my preceptor, Dr. Rowan, and my advisor, Guan and Corey, and Facilis Trust for funding this project. Also, a big thanks to the Department of RS Applied to Medicine and my classmate, family, and friends for their support. All right, that's the end of my presentation. Now I'm ready for your thoughts, comments, and questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much. Research that satisfies them and the research of their own that their signature style that you see in the process, it only expands and gets better. But it's still it's a personal style that you want to keep in the storytelling that you all think. The means in which you create these assets communicate science and medicine. It's all individual, but it is part of the family. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and here is one of the questions. And um, the information is so much easier to understand the message. But you um, mentioned about conflicting information. 
make could impose on older procedures, do you find that you have an opportunity to research to verify that that information is correct? So uh, what what I did is I do like uh, check in every fact uh, by myself, like manually, but that's a problem for now. But in future, probably like a couple months, it, it won't be a problem because like at that time I was using ChatGPT. Now there's like a better one, uh, Microsoft Bing. They hook up the internet, the reference almost correct. So, so I, I would say just stay open-minded. And then when you need to solve the problem, you go for looking for your tools, yeah. Yeah, so uh, the goal is to finish the whole uh, 12 mini uh, animation section, and then we planning to host the animation resource on the Hopkins uh, Otolaryngology website. Yeah, so that's our goal for uh, all audience. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I want to uh, take, uh, give an example of, so when I thinking about doing my voiceover, the, the main reason to jump right into AI because I cannot afford like real person uh, voiceover for 12, the whole 12 animation. So uh, I don't know, I, I didn't really calculate the math, but it would be a lot because the, the whole animation uh, in total will be like 12 minutes. So for that uh, amount of voiceover is really expensive. Yeah, but in the future, we also planning to uh, access the AI workflow thing more officially and more scientifically to document it and share with uh, other content creator. Thanks. Yeah, I think my opinion is I think it's really cool tool to learn. And for me, I'm an international student. Uh, my English is not as fluent as native speaker, but I do know about like what's the story I want to tell. So this kind of tool is perfect for me. I would encourage uh, everyone to try it out. If you don't like it, you can still uh, write by yourself, but at least try it out. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank all the families and friends who came from near and far, especially from far. We were really glad to have this many people um, in person and in the audience, as well as online. I wanna use a moment to recruit thesis topics for next year. If there are any faculty in other departments who have a visualization challenge, they would like our students to um, take on and come up with a creative um, perspective on it. I um, am collecting proposals. It's a simple one page proposal um, through the end of this month and I'll be at the reception and you can take my business card and I'll send you the form. We also have some thank yous. I really want to thank the preceptors uh, who uh, proposed the topics and steered the students through this. Preceptor, we had several first time preceptors who hadn't worked with our students before. And I know that there's a little bit of a learning curve, but I think that um, the outcomes were tremendous. I also want to thank the faculty in our department who served as advisors to the students, helping keep the scope of the project um, appropriate and uh, uh, making sure that deadlines were met. The students really project manage these themselves, but I think faculty are important um, because they've done it year over year. 
Uh, I want to thank Sarah Poynton, who helps our students with their presentation uh, skills. As you saw, these guys gave phenomenal presentations. Um, and I want to thank uh, Daisha and Maggie, who have helped us make sure this day runs smoothly, both with the technology, um, getting everything ready, and also for the reception, which I would welcome everyone to join us. Um, we can walk probably a, a third of the people here know where we're going. So just follow somebody who knows. Um, we can go across the courtyard, um, past the fish pond, into the Phipps building, and there'll be some refreshments. There'll be the students' um, final graduation show hanging. So they've picked about um, 12 of their best pieces to display. And um, there'll be opportunities for you to ask further questions based on these outstanding presentations. Thank you all for coming. Make sure I put up to well, get to well to, to, to undo what he just did. Darrell, the audio guy who helped set it oh, up, the, he the, just he yeah. just killed it, and I need I need the other screen to stop the live screen. Oh, okay. Oh, Uh, yep. Yeah. 